Here we go. We're good to go. Welcome to another Op Roundtable. This time we're joined by the Hughes and Q's crew, essentially. So we're going to be talking about um, Hughes and Q's and meet the design team behind the game uh, and learn all we can about the newest party game uh, from the Op. Uh, I'm Ross Thompson, my marketing manager. I've been at the Op a couple of years now, uh, and I'm excited to, to be a part of this roundtable. Uh, Scott? Hi, my name is Scott Brady, and I am the designer behind Hughes and Cues. Tony? Hi, my name is Tony Cerebriani. I am the director of inventor relations and international sales at the Op. And Pat? I'm Pat Marino, and I am the game design manager at the Op. Fantastic. So Hughes and Cues is one of the newest party games from the Op. It has been exciting. We, it is out in stores now. You can, you can pick it up wherever games are sold. Uh, it has been filling up our colorful screens as we've seen it online. I think it's one of my favorite parts about it is you can tell when somebody is live streaming it because when you scroll down, it is there on your feed. Uh, and obviously we have times are a little different right now. We're not able to be at shows, but it is cool that the game does work on stream. So we're able to see a lot more about that. Um, so Scott, tell us about Hughes and Cues. Well, Hughes and Cues is a, uh, a game about, you know, it's a party game for three to 10 players about uh, matching our color perceptions. Uh, it's founded from my experience in the print industry. And um, you know, one of the worst parts of our job was talking to customers about, uh, about color and trying to get them to agree on it. So it comes, you know, the idea behind the game is, is some of the steals from some of the color matching systems out there. And, um, gamifies that and, and spurs conversation about uh, color with dabble in color theory a little bit, but more about how we all recall color based upon our, our life experiences and our own perceptions of those colors. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Tony. And uh, Pat, what are your thoughts on what using cues is? I mean, for me, it, it kind of fits in, into some of what we discuss in some of our other party games is this sort of miscommunication where you're trying to get an idea across, but there's just some barrier there. Um, and it, it makes me think of all the times where like, you know, somebody's trying to describe a, a shirt color or, you know, a paint color if they're repainting a room and what they want. And, and it's, it's just this difference in opinion almost of what a color is uh, or what color an object is or should be. Um, and trying to get that point across when really there's no, good clear way without going into like um you know rgb values to describe a color and, and and people can't really do that and say like oh well i can look at the wall and tell you like exactly what shade of gray this is um and so it kind of takes that that debate or that that misconception and, and makes it into a really fun gaming experience i agree tony so uh one of the things that I really like about the game is the uh, visual impact that the board has. It's sort of arresting because it's just so bright and beautiful. And from a gameplay perspective, I think an interesting thing that takes place is, although we all may, experiencing, may be experiencing things in a similar setting, our perception of those things is going to be different. And so this game plays off of that in a very unique way. And because the game is really about, you know, you're sort of trying to get people to find your target color. And so you're just using small descriptions that help you do that. And the, the level of communication and misinterpretation and difference of opinion that can come out of, about that is just beautiful to listen to and watch. And then the table talk that happens because of it is just so unique. It really is. Um, so along with that, how, how did you come up with, like, I know you kind of mentioned, like, it's the, it's the, from, from your print background, but, right. at, but how did you come up with the design for the game? Well, it was more, it, the game began as more of a, just a personal challenge. You know, it, it's to see if I could come up with something that called upon, you know, my, my life experiences. And it began as something completely different than what it is now as I went through different iterations of the game. I had the idea in mind, but the core idea was still, I wanted this color perception matching. You know, I wasn't trying to make a game of, 
you know, what color is a ruby or what, you know, what was Little Red Riding Hood's cape and, you know, where it was more almost trivia centric. It was more, I, I wanted to, to uh, pay tribute to the experience of trying to get two people to agree that a color is this particular color. And so, um, as I said, you know, went through a bunch of different versions until one day I was doing probably what a lot of other designers do and was doing some Google image searches for inspiration. And I came across a scientific heat map that um, just clicked as far as this is the solution. Everyone's looking at the same thing. That was one of the manufacturing issues that I knew that had to be overcome was to make sure everyone was looking at the same color at the table. And um, after seeing this, just a generic, I don't even remember what the subject matter was, but it was one of those things that just clicked and came up with the design of the board as it, very similar to the final product now, um, that made the game work, made the scoring work, made the communication work, gave everyone an incentive to match, which a lot of games don't, they leave the clue giver out and, um, uh, it just kind of all fell into place at that point. So um, as you designed that, uh, how did the pitching process go? I know I, I, I love sharing the story about how it came to us, but uh, how, how was that journey? Well, the, you know, I think I took a different route than most, most game designers do. You know, I've, I've, I'm fortunate that my wife has a very good relationship with probably over a hundred different publishers. So I was able to capitalize on that network. And at Geek with the West last year um, was the first time we showed the game in public. And we had some publisher friends there who absolutely loved it and actually made us offers on the spot. But I had one publisher in particular that pulled me aside and said, Scott, you need to look bigger. You, all these people here, including himself, would love to publish the game, but he didn't feel that anyone in the building could do the game justice, that I needed to reach out to larger companies that could really get this out there because it had a potential. And he threw around, you know, numbers and figures, and it's like, this is what you need to be looking at. Cool. And I'm very thankful for him for that advice because because of that advice, we brought it to Origins. We had made a couple appointments with uh, publishers who we knew. We knew their product line. We knew the people. And I didn't want to do a shotgun approach and, and show it to everyone and see who wanted it. I really thought I had the opportunity, again, based upon his recommendation that, you know, we could really, I could, as a designer, target the publisher that was best fit to to and would do the game justice and of course the op was was the the final choice at at one point um i i remember ross reaching out to you via facebook messenger about hey i've got something to show you it was pretty vague about it i really wasn't trying to be pushy i was i knew i was capitalizing on our relationship i've known you since you were at the op last time and then left and came back. And um, I knew I was asking for a favor. And I think, you know, in, in hindsight, when I met with you and Pat at the booth, I think, um, I think it was a favor. You know, I, I think you probably, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you maybe thought, oh, here's just another guy pitching a game. Um, uh, I've known him for a while, so I will do him a favor and take a look at it. And I hope, you know, you left that meeting thinking, hey, I'm glad I took this meeting rather than it just being a favor. I tell that story of you pitching the game to us all the time. I think Tony and Pat have probably heard it two or three times this week. Uh, I, Fair. Yep. <laughs> I mean, it, it's a good... I, I had been in for a while, right? And, but it, half of this industry is networking and stuff like that. Right. And so everyone's got a game design. Everyone does, right? Mm -hmm. And especially at the op, if we have the opportunity to help get games into game stores or the potential for mass or all different kinds of places. We, we put games on shelves in places that continue to impress me. 
um, which is very cool. So when you came to us and you were like, hey, I want to make sure this game gets the right, the right venue, and I think the app can do that, I was like, cool, let's, let's take a look at it. And like Pat can probably talk too, but like it, I wanted to play it the minute we were done. So uh, that was super good. Pat, you want to talk about it a little more? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think um, anytime we're at conventions, and, and this is usually um, Tony leading the charge on, on inventor submissions, but um, my feeling on it is, and, and I think Tony would agree, is, is it's always worth the time, right, to see what a designer has to show and, and what they can bring to the table because the next great game can come from anywhere. Um, and, and we don't want to close our, our doors or narrow our scope so much that we miss out on some great opportunity to make a fantastic game. And so, you know, sometimes somebody will come by and pitch something and we look at it and can tell pretty quick it's not for us. Um, but I think with Hughes and Hughes, as, as Ross has said, like we both tell the story, is that board unfolded onto the table and immediately people walking by the booth were, what are you playing? Can we join? You know, and, and that was the kind of thing of like, okay, that's, that's the first checkbox is people see the table presence and they want to be part of what we're doing. I think the next thing for me in looking at this kind of a game is that we were mid game when that happened and we were able to fold those players in without disrupting the flow of what we were doing because the rules are so quick to learn. It's so easy to understand what's happening. And on top of that, it's like when we got a prototype back in the office and we're showing it to other people, I didn't even need the rule sheet that was in there because the rules were so easy to memorize, right? And that makes a party game so much easier to share because you go to somebody's house, you play this game, you like it, and you know that if you go buy your own copy, you can teach your friends and family to play with minimal effort, right? Because you already remember what all the rules were from the last time you played it. Um, and so those things kind of all started checking the boxes. And I, I remember thinking like, our sales team's going to love this. Marketing team's going to love this. Like we have to get this back in the office and figure it out. Um, so, you know, I was very eager to get back to Tony who wasn't at origins with us that year and, and show it to him and take the next steps. Tony? I'd like to add that yes, uh, everyone who, who sees this and eventually wants to pitch to the, to the op and if they get Ross and Pat, they have mean poker faces. <laughs> because, you know, I, I showed it to some other publishers and who were friends also. And of course, they're very excited and whatever. And I left that meeting with those two gentlemen and walked up to my wife. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what they thought. I couldn't read them. I, and my wife said, said that she was watching to the side. And at one point, she saw. Pat kind of give a little nod to Ross, but she wasn't sure what to make of it. <laughs> you guys didn't didn't show your hand at all at the meeting. I I have to do a good job of of that is tough for me because I'm an excited puppy. So <laughs> <laughs> so but like it's and it's tough because like we get pitched a lot of games and I've sat in at multiple companies that I've been at throughout my career. Like and when you get pitched a game, it, it's tough because even if the game isn't going to be a fit for the company and you say, oh my gosh, I like this, that can sometimes, those words have weight, right? And you don't want to give the wrong impression that I'm a publisher, I'm dangling this carrot in front of you. Cool, let me take your prototype home. At that point now, if I've said I liked your game and I'm taking your prototype home, that gives you a totally different impression that what may actually be happening, right? So uh, I'm glad that that props on my end right for having a <laughs> poker face on that because i i will say like that's it's it's difficult uh but i know that the, the minute that you had left i told the i told pat i was like i wanted to come back so we can play again like that was <laughs> uh, tony you're, you're saying yeah so i i think if i recall correctly pat may have even reached out right after that and said that you guys had saw us had seen something really uh interesting and with some really good potential to it and uh one of the great things that pat said is is so true you just don't know what you're going to see and where it's going to come from and the challenging thing about being in the position that i have is everybody sees me like a giant billboard right and they want to come and throw everything at me to see what will stick on that billboard and the challenging thing with that is, is that I have to say no way more than I ever get to say yes. And with that, even the things that I'm saying yes to for 
send stuff in for us to review, even all of that, there's still more no's than yeses. And so what's really great is when I can't be at a show and there are other folks on our team who do have the opportunity to see something and it sort of passes that first uh, wave of, uh, of expectation and interest, which is primarily, is it fun? And do, are others going to be easily able to engage in it? And Pat just essentially described exactly that, right? So I think what's the beautiful thing about this process and just this whole pitching in general is that I, like Ross said, I, I can get to be pretty excited about stuff that I see, but it's not just me who has to create, make, and then sell the game. We have a whole team. We have a whole um, product list that we're doing, you know, product line we're doing for the year. And we only have a certain number of windows for certain numbers of types of games. And so it's a very lengthy process of trying to find the needle in the haystack for the right games for us. And so when we find a game like Hughes and Cues that resonates on so many levels within not only the company, but within the player experience, it's just so wonderful to, to, to be able to help that product come to reality. And it was a relatively short time between Origins and Gen Con where we were able to like shake hands and say, okay, let's make this happen. And one of the things I think I really appreciated about working with you, Scott, is that you were very candid and very open with where you're at in your process and you know where you've been to that point where we were at in the discussion. And you know, I knew that the game was good enough that if I didn't get to publish it, if the op didn't get to publish it, that I still wanted to see it published because it's that good of a game. So, you know, willing to help, you know, do what was necessary to find the right publisher for it if it wasn't going to be us. And I think the fact that we are the ones that are behind the publishing it, publishing it within the industry is great because now because of what we've been doing internationally, we've got a throughput to get um, the game in a, to a really broad distribution here in the US, but potentially internationally, which is very exciting for us. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was like, I'm all, I'm all down on what Tony's saying here. So it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's good. I, one of the fun things too, when it, when it came back and we were playing it internally, like as Tony and Pat have mentioned, like we, we're a big company. We're a company of about maybe 60 people. So when, when we have different workshops that we do to play different games, and when that game was getting played, it, people were actively getting up and getting other people to come in to go play with them that, that don't normally do workshops and stuff like that. And, and even like the sales team, like, and they're like some of the main pushers too. Like if they like a game, they're like, we need to do this now. And a couple of the sales folk, the minute they played it, they went up to the high upper management and they were like, this game needs to happen. So it was that. <laughs> Pat, remember what? And I think even even people who were who were a little hesitant on the game because it's just not their type of play experience, but like, okay, just watch, watch this other group play, and then it was like, okay, now I get it, now I see. Yeah. Yeah. We we talked earlier in this week about like how one of the kind of consistent things for all the games we do is that it's they're games you want to share with other people, right? Like because you love the IP, because you love the play experience, whatever it may be. Um, but they're approachable, they're easy to teach, they're memorable, um, and they're things that like people play and then become advocates for. And I think what, what Ross and Tony are talking about is like when this game came in the building, it wasn't a case of like, you know, sometimes with, with prototypes that come in, we kind of have to wrangle people to say, we need you to try this and give us your opinion on it. But with this one, it was like, okay, we sit down and play it with 10 people on a full table. And then those people were taking it on lunch breaks and saying, oh, I'm going to go play it with these other people. And we weren't having to do that like, Oh, don't forget to try this one out. It was it was kind of finding its way through the building on its own uh, because of the game board, because of the components and the appearance of it and everything. And um, there's some some great memories that came out of that too. And one of my my favorites was uh, a misunderstanding about what a two word clue is. Um, so <laughs> we were playing um, with with one of our concept designers uh, who's named O'Neill, uh, and O'Neill's awesome. He's just such a, a positive person, um, and you know, we said, okay, you give a one word clue. And then the second time you give a two word clue. But what he interpreted that as was two more one word clues. So he had this sort of shade of beige or brown that he was trying to get us to guess. And I forget what his first clue was, but I won't ever forget the second one because we get to the two word clue and he looks at us and goes, gravy cornucopia. 
Oh, that's where that's from. That's where that's from. Oh. And, and everybody went, what is a gravy cornucopia? And he said, oh, the words have to connect? And we're like, well, I guess not really, but it helps. <laughs> I had no idea that's where that phrase came from. Yeah, that's, oh. that's where it's from. That's funny. Uh, so, so speaking of, uh, of playtest stuff, um, Scott, Tony, Pat, uh, do you guys have any um, playtest memories like what, like what Pat just shared, the kind of as you were going through and figuring out the, the mechanics? Yeah, I've got, I'll, take, I'll take that one. It's right. uh, part of the design process, of course, was, was you know, what colors to include. And um, the original board that I submitted as a prototype was, is very different than what we actually ended up on. Um, as I continued to play test it, even after submitting it to, to the op, uh, we had one, you know, one of the things, one of the, the motivations I had behind designing Hughes and Cues was um, I wanted a game that was approachable, easy to learn, which I think it, clicked, it checked those boxes, but that a six-year-old and an 80-year-old could play on and even ground. And, you know, so many party games that are word-based or, or whatever that an, an older player just has a, a, an advantage over a younger player because of more life experience or better vocabulary or, or what have you. And so one of the ultimate goals was to, to – design and prove that this game could be played by over multiple generations in the same game on an equal competitive field. So we're playing this game with a wide range of ages and there's this, this young kid, probably five or six years old. And the board at the time had a lot more brown in one area than the current board does. And they were very pronounced browns. And um, his one word clue was poop. <laughs> <laughs> and he took advantage of the fact that he scored nine points on the first clue instituted the rule where he didn't have to give his second clue and and really really did well just because of everyone's perception of what he thought poop looked like was dead on <laughs> so i noticed there isn't brown on the board now there's there's much less and much they're not it's not quite as poop colored <laughs> <laughs> that's funny uh tony i got a good, got a good story so uh, um we have a number of really dear friends that we play some games with when we're at that stage where we're um either in development on a game or very close to making the decision to move on a game and what's important in that process of play test evaluation at least for us on the publishing side is to get outside of our own walls so that we can you know validate what it is we think is actually working very well so sometimes we bring people into the office to do play testing and evaluation in in the office which is great because then the designers can be there and listen and watch and get direct feedback and and integrate uh updates and changes based on watching people play and sometimes some of us will take games home to do the same thing, but in a sort of a friend group setting or a family setting so that it's less formalized and more just about seeing the dynamics that unfold. So this one group of friends of ours that we have played a couple of our games with early on in development phases, uh, we were having dinner with and then we brought this game out and they were all taken aback at just the beauty of the, the gradient spread first and foremost. And like we talked about that in and of itself for a, a few minutes, Two of them are artists and their house is filled with all this amazing art too. So I knew they were gonna be um, uh, fans of the game just because of that. So it gets to our, our dear friend um, Kim's turn and she's the mom of the family. And I, it was either her first clue I think was uh, tangerine. And so everyone's guessing in this, you know, sort of orangey, peachy kind of color and she's like whoa like she's like she completely thought that we were missing the boat so then she had to come up with another clue to get us to near where we actually needed to be based on her color target and then there the conversation that ensued about our perception of fruit she's like 
this is she pointed out her color after everything you know and i think she may have scored one point because mm -hmm. she got a peripheral uh scoring frame point and nobody got in her actual color and she went and got a piece of fruit off of a tree from her yard and said this is the color i'm talking about she put it on the board like oh you're right <laughs> <laughs> Because it was in this sort of ripening stage, not like a fully ripe, ready to eat. And it was just like, oh my God, it was more pink and less orange. And oh, it was just so funny. And just that whole describing and proving and table talk that takes place is just so unique and just so much uh, part of the joy of the play of this game. I, I think you're describing what I ended up discovering through playtesting. And it wasn't something that was intentional. It was people get real defensive about how they perceive color and want to prove it. I mean, it's definitely, you know, we see people pulling up, you know, pulling up Google and say, no, this is the color. This is what it should have been. This is what I meant. And proving that they were actually right all this time when everyone else was, was way off. We had something real similar at, a, at, at Geekway when we were showing it with someone that we didn't know who, um, gave us the clue lion -o. Now, in retrospect, he was referring to lion -o from Thundercats. That's what I was thinking, so like with the red hair or with like the yeah. silver That's chest? That's exactly or... what he was referring to, okay. but it was a case of not not playing to his audience, one, because some of us didn't had no idea what he was talking about. And, you know, the fact that he was specifically honing in on the hair was another thing. So, you know, once he finally revealed his final clue or, you know, his final color, everyone was on their phones trying to find our pictures. And of course, even that case, depending upon the screen grab or if it was, you know, high def television or whatever, even those shades varied as well, or even from an Android to an iPhone, you know, display. Um, but yeah, we found that people, you know, the discussion, it actually, the game actually ended up being longer than we anticipated because there was so much discussion between rounds about, you know, how that person perceived that color. Well, I don't know. I, that's a good, I'm going to see <laughs> if I can sneak that in there now. <laughs> well, there's always those moments though, right, where like somebody gives a clue that they think is just going to be the clue, right? Like this is the one. And, and, and I've seen some funny ones like cucumber and watermelon where it's like, well, those things have, like two or more distinct colors, right? You have the outside of the cucumber, the inside, the seeds, the watermelon rind versus the, the flesh versus the seeds. And, and they'll throw that out there thinking like, I nailed it. And then the whole table just looks at them like, there's two halves of the board I can go to here and I'm not sure which one until I get the next clue. Um, and you see it kind of sink in. And then there's other times where like a clue throw goes out there and you think it's gonna be a long shot. And, and one of my favorites is Grimace referring to the purple guy from McDonald's, oh, right? And, and people kind of pause and are picturing the facial expression and then it'll dawn for somebody and they just nail that purple right away. And everybody goes, oh, the grimace. Okay, and everybody gets it. And it's like, how does everyone know <laughs> that color so well? It makes me so happy. Yeah. It's so, it's so That's funny. Ross's go-to. I've seen him live stream. I've piece. used it twice though. <laughs> it is, I, it's just because like purple's a weird one. Right, like, and is eggplant one word, right, and things like that. Yeah. So it's, uh, but but it's funny because Katie's been using lavender in her how-to demos because that's an that's an okay word to use, right, right, and that's a good purple as well. So I played with I played with someone the other day, um, and he used Victoria's Secret for for a clue too on for a purple as like their as their their two one, and I was like, I don't, that's, that's, you know, that's after dark version, so it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, it's 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 really. I, I think one of the things that this game we, we, we talk about how this game has discussion when it comes to colors and stuff like that. And what I really appreciate about this game is that it kind of takes a spin on game design too, because it it of course it's it's a game. You know, like we sell games in the tabletop space, but it's not the traditional. I'm trying to outplay competitive you or worker placement. This like it's a game where it's kind of universal. You know, I, I the, the rules are simple. Hey, you're going to get one clue and then two clues. Here's your card. Go, and it really kind of lets everybody have that discussion about life. You know, like when we played with Ruel the other day, I had no idea that he was colorblind, right? Mm -hmm. 
And so he was talking about, he had a, a yellow that he was using for a clue or a stop stoplight or something. And we were all kind of on our shade that we would pick. And his wife was saying, she was like, no, you gotta go a few more down because he sees it a little darker than we all see that. And he's like, yeah, it was so, if, if, so if you watch the, the his how to play with the live at five, you notice they all put their stuff, away. and he was like, oh yeah, they, they just know to put it a little darker for whatever clue I'm giving. And I'm like, that's an interesting way. And that's kind of one of the first questions that pops up too, because I like, guess we're looking for games to be more inclusive uh, for people of all walks of life, um, you know, and this one drew, jumps out is it's got color, like in, in, you know, and there's all these pushes now for colorblind stuff. And when you uh, even brought that up at Origins, you were like, well, it's how you perceive color. And I think like we heard that a little bit, but now that it's been out in the world and we're seeing a lot more of that, it's really cool that it has that, um, what is color perception versus, um, you know, like just regular gameplay. Um, so now that it's been out there, um, open question pretty much, like how are you guys feeling about the game now that people have been playing it and seeing it? Scott, I know that's been a big thing for you. Uh, how are you enjoying the reception? It's been fantastic for me. I mean, it's, you know, I think any, any person who puts any, creative product out there whether it be a game or a piece of art or a book or whatever you're always worried about what the, the whether the public's really going to accept it and so i have to admit the first time that you informed me that there were going to be a couple live plays and i was nervous to tune in not just to the video but to read the comments because you know you're not supposed to read the comments right and um, i was so pleasantly surprised that um People were enjoying it almost, it reminded me of the original playtesting with friends and family here in town. Um, it was, um, you know, everyone was excited about it. They loved the design of the board. They thought it was very attractive. Um, it, I saw some comments in a couple of them where, you know, their profession might be in the graphics art industry or, or um, graphic design and how they re how, the, how it really spoke to them and, and you know, kind of brought their profession into the game world. And so, you know, seeing people's reactions of, of that level of acceptance um, was so satisfying. And, and I continue to enjoy watching people play and talk about it and, and, and you know, hope that someday, you know, we're all able to be at a convention and stand back and, watch someone live play that's you know ultimately my next goal is just to just to see in person what their actual reactions are um and on that um you know hopefully we can all be at conventions um whenever that happens um i look forward to that too um I, we were having our gen con conversations back in november it was like oh this game's gonna be the hit like we, we were when you had brought up having a giant using cues board like we were discussing how can we take over the wall in our room with Velcro <laughs> and just get Velcro cones and try to do different stuff and all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, Pat and Tony, what do you guys, like how has it been so far watching everybody check it out? I mean, I always enjoy anytime, you know, we, we release a product and seeing the, the response on board game geek on social media and different channels and seeing what the reviewers have to say. Um, and it's, it's especially exciting when we have an, an outside designer, particularly one who's doing their first game and being able to see that really positive response and kind of thinking back to, you know, when, when I was in that spot of like, okay, this is the first game and I know exactly what you're saying, Scott, because that doesn't go away with the next game and the game after that where you're like, oh man, we, I think we did everything we could, but let's hope when someone who's not me plays this, you know, who's not part of the op or whatever, that, that they feel the way about it that we do. And, and so far, that's been the response for Hughes and Cues. And then people are, you know, as I said before, that it's a game that people want to share. Um, and I've actually seen people who work for other publishers sharing it. And that's always a sign that it's like, okay, we're transcending, you know, the reviewers and, and folks who whose role is to promote a game and, and getting advocates from the industry and, and people who are gamers saying, you, you got to try this one. It's, it's just a game we're all going to love. You got to get it. Um, and that's always really exciting to see that kind of response. Tony? Yeah, I would agree that the, for me, one of the greatest things that, that Pat just touched on was the, the desire to share and the level of which people are sharing uh, this is so wonderful. The game is such 
a beautiful design from a mechanic level mixed with a great graphic design and you put those two together for a play experience the people who are playing it for the first time are having such an amazing time they they become brand ambassadors they adopt it as they're the ones that discovered it and they want to share it out and so it's such great eye candy for Facebook and Instagram and TikTok. And it's just so exciting to see these color swatches just show up and it's like instantaneously, you know what it is, you know? Um, there's a couple other games that have done that in the recent past and it's, and it's really exciting to see that we've got one that can sort of fold into that similar mix. Yeah, we just need to work on getting the rest of the op the same shirt that Scott has. <laughs> uh, <laughs> why don't we make some custom tiki design oh, don't, shirt, don't huh? tease me like that don't tease <laughs> me like that uh, that that'd be great so scott what's the uh what's the hues and cues in the background there oh so um of course my my daughters are huge fans of the game they've seen every iteration of it and 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 given their input along the way and and still you know, play it regularly with their friends um during this quarantine, my youngest daughter decided to take a piece of canvas and and paint her own board, and so that's that's what you see there. It's uh, she painted the gradation behind it, and we used masking tape to mask off some squares and spray paint everything else black. And um, she wanted her her artwork featured today. Cool. So. <laughs> and that's not the only piece of sort of creative expression in your house that's hues and cues related, is it? Well, no, it's not. Um, we contracted with a high school friend who's uh, super into quilting, and um, she uh, took a she has a, a inventory of old swatches and stuff, and sat down and created a, uh, a quilt that pays tribute to the Hughes and Hughes board, and uh, should have that. It should be finished completely in July. She sends it out for the actual quilting process. And I'm um, going to be excited to show that off. And uh, she made it for our, our queen size bed, and we'll have it in our guest room. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. You get, you, I, I, if we're going to go on for five more seconds, you, you made a hues and cues for Animal Crossing, too, right? Oh, that's true. I forgot. <laughs> so my oldest daughter is big into Animal Crossing. And um, I got the idea, I think, from, I think Pat originally sprung the idea because he posted a competitor's game, I think, in his Animal Crossing. <laughs> And um, I got to thinking, it's like, oh, I think I can do that. So I made a small one um, and uh, posted it. And then I started seeing some other people posting their Animal Crossing creations. So we sat down and really pushed the limitation of, of how many custom pieces you can have at Animal Crossing. was able to recreate the entire Hughes and Q's board in her farm, which she still has there today. That's cool. Yeah. And and I've since replaced the one I had with a with a Hughes and Cues art piece on my wall. We were joking. Oh, great. You know, we were gonna take the the one that that you have and scale it up so a whole island would be a playable board, and you could yell out the color, and everybody could run around and stand on on the one they think it is. <laughs> no, nobody's had the time yet. <laughs> that would be so that's good. Really yeah. clever. So good. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, it's so, been fun coming up with the creative, you know, just, again, and, you know, it's our first game, and and as Pat said, it's, you know, the excitement level here is very, very high, and so we can pay tribute to doing something fun like that. We love doing that. And as we should, like, we're only in, like, I think we're still in the first month of it being out on shelves, yeah. um, and it, it's, it's you know, as, as more stores open up and people get out there, uh, I'm, I'm really excited to see it hit the tabletop uh, for game nights. Um, I know I, I buy copy because I work here, obviously, but I get, mm -hmm. it's going to be one where we're going to be doing that. A lot of the regulars from my game night, they've been asking, hey, how, like, when can we start coming over? And I'm like, well, let's, let's, let's wait. Because, <laughs> but on that, like, Houston Cues has been at the top of the list. So um, That's great. That's I heard good. from a, a friend at one of the publishers, or at one of the distributors, who messaged me the other day and goes, hey, I can't even get a copy and our, and we are completely sold out. We're waiting on the op to get us some more of them. Wow. That's, that's great. Uh, let's yeah. try about that after this, after this thing so we can make sure they're, they're set up. But yeah, that's, it's, we're hearing a very similar reception and it's, it's really cool to see. Um, it, I think with Rodney's video that he did, I was kind of, it was like, we, we got to get him one of those shirts too, Scott, so that he can 
<laughs> thing with it, but it's it's going to be a lot of fun. I think as as we've kind of like said, like it, it pops right in it. I, I'm looking forward to walking in and seeing it on a store shelf because it, it's not like even with the behind me, like it, it it stands out, you know. And with so many games out there now, it's it's cool that there gets to be a game where you're like, you, you see it and you can already be like, I can kind of figure out what this is going to be. So. Right. Um, yeah, any any um, lasting thoughts you guys are hoping that people will enjoy about the game? We've already, we've already covered a whole bunch, so it's all good. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll throw out there. I mean, I, I, I hope everybody kind of walks away with some of the stories we do of those memorable moments of the clue that went awry or, you know, the debate that happened over, you know, how people perceive a color and, and those kinds of things. I think that's what really cements a game um as as a true part of somebody's collection for me is is you know it's it's the game you want to break out again and every time you play it you have those stories of well the last time we played and remember that time that so and so did this and and i think this is a game that really pushes that and that kind of conversation that goes beyond just the the emotions of the game and creates stories and memories and i think that's what people are going to find when they play that's great i hope, I hope that um as people play uh from a mechanic level, as the active player, you draw a card and on your card, you have four choices and you get to choose one of those. And oftentimes people will choose something that's more familiar or really close to them as far as what they can give a clue about. I hope that as people play the game more, they really push their ability to play the ones that are harder on those cards so that they actually push the limits of what they think they can give a clue about. And uh, therefore the game to me has lots of replayability because of that. And I hope to, uh, you know, not only be able to share more stories about the last time kind of stuff, as Pat was just talking about, but uh, pushing the limits of, of your clue giving. And so we can get, get some more of those gravy cornucopia like clues. <laughs> <laughs> gravy cornucopia. Cool. So I've heard, uh, you know, for me, you know, I encourage people to try it, to add on to what I said earlier about it being able to be played over generations of players. I heard a story recently of a, of a family a gathering that they were having for a dinner. And because the game is so light in the rules that a person was able to, while it was set up on the, the dining table, um, one of the players was actually able to stand over in the kitchen, was working on dinner, and then when it was her turn, was able to come over, place her guests, or to give her clue. And it was you know, more of a laid back experience that can be, you know, it's less on the competitive side. We saw that, you know, most people didn't even care about the scores for the most part anyway. It was more about the experience. So I hope people are able to, I'm looking forward to people being able to uh, try it out and experience that for themselves. That's great. And I, I think we all are, and we've covered, we've covered a lot of really cool stuff in regards to Hughes and Cues. Um, thank you all for joining us today for this, uh, for this, Op at Home uh, Roundtable Discussion. Uh, Hughes and Cues is available now, so you can find it wherever games are sold. Check it out on the app website for more information. Scott, thank you so much for joining us today. And Thanks for having me. Very much so. Tony and Pat, always good. Cool. Thank you, guys.